chap there we go. 29 and verse, uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 12. I think we'll pick up our commentary down here in uh, 15 or 16. I, we'd mentioned, I had it marked here, but I think we'd gone a little bit further than what I had marked. Verse 12, that thou shouldest enter into the covenant with the Lord thy God and into his, uh, into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee uh, today for a people unto himself that he may be unto thee a God as he hath sworn unto thee and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob uh, the God we serve is a God of promise he's got a good memory uh, what he says it may be a long time coming but he's never uh, never lost sight of his goals in that which is to have a people for his name. You know, it's interesting. God's never going to settle for people for his name until it's all the people that are for his name. Uh, one day this world, you know, you, you look at people and they, they're not interested in the Lord. They're not interested in the Bible. They're not interested in the church. And God says, that's okay. That's, I am. And uh, pretty soon he's just going to weed those, uh, those uh, folks out. And if they persist in that, uh, lack of uh, interest or, uh, or disinterest, uh, they will uh, find themselves on the wrong side of the Lord. Uh, as uh, Ephesians says, without God, without promise, and without hope in this world, and certainly without hope in the next. All right, so he says here, um, verse 14, neither to you only do I make this covenant uh, and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us today. So this is an ongoing covenant. Uh, for you know how we uh, dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye passed by, and have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Those people that came out, came out a mixed multitude, but God said, you're, you're in the right crowd but you're going to have to fit into the, the, the standards for that crowd because there's not going to be two. You know, in, in America today, we're, we're, we are so busy uh, sowing the seeds of our own destruction at just about every level uh, that you could possibly and conceivably imagine, from racial problems to strife, uh, problems of uh, finances and culture and class and everything else, and it's the old uh, Marxian uh, divide and conquer thing, just to split things up into as many factions as you can, because they're all easier to control like that. And at the, at the bottom of it all, the Lord Jesus said, uh, a, king divided against his, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Just as simple as that. The devil's tactics of divide and conquer have been taken over by political groups, racial groups, financial groups. And, and each one of them, they, they find out what, a, what an amazing level of success they have, uh, at least in their own eyes, and at least temporarily. But uh, the triumph of the wicked is short. It may be long by our day-to-day -day standards, but it's short by God's standards. And one day righteousness will have its, uh, its victories over all of these uh, individual uh, things here. So in verse 14 down through 16, not to Israel only, but to all those that sticks by them. Now we went through this last week in Matthew 25 from verse uh, 31, the throne of his glory and how those people are, are brought into the millennial kingdom. Uh, the ones that thought they deserved to go in there are thrown out. And the ones that didn't understand why they were even being welcomed in there were brought in by the Lord with this uh, shadow of, uh, I don't know why you're allowing this. Uh, brought in there. And it really comes down to the issues of the heart. And uh, if it's uh, truly out of the heart, the, uh, the mouth speaketh. Uh, those people that are pride and arrogant and think, I deserve it, God says, no, you don't. And those people that said, I just just did kind of what was right, what I, you know, just to compassion and, and uh, whatnot for Israel and for those Jews, seeing the problems they were in, God says, I like that, come on in. Uh, that doesn't mean they're born again, but they're allowed into the place where, uh, where they are in God's favor as far as being in the, the uh, kingdom. 
Uh, down here in verse 17, he speaks about their abominations. The, the nations as Israel passed by uh, were very evident in their hatred for Israel, their hatred for the people of God. Uh, you know, you might almost think, well, they didn't know who they were dealing with. Well, I think that's probably true in one sense. No lost man knows what he's dealing with when he tells God, take a hike. Uh, that said, they're just typically not interested in finding out who the God is that's, uh, that's with them. And each time that they uh, made overtures against Israel, God uh, just, just gave them a crushing defeat and gave Israel the victory uh, just to prove who he was. And these people never seemed to learn the lesson. Uh, you know, one of the things lost people have the, uh, a, a very uh, high tolerance for is making up excuses of why it couldn't be God. It has to be something else. Uh, you, you get saved and you go from, from drugs or just a kind of a wild life or a crazy life or just an indifferent life to want to be that three time a week Christian. And people look at you, well, well, he got religion or, or you know, the, the, somebody brainwashed him or something. They could never attribute that to God because it would be a, a, an offense against themselves to point out, well, he, you know, look what God did for him, but I, I'm not doing any of that, so God's not doing that for me. We ought to just be mindful that uh, God is still interested in every one of us, still has a great uh, personal interest in our lives, but not ours only. Even in the lost, God would save to the uttermost all that will come to God by the Lord Jesus Christ. His willingness is not, uh, is not uh, done away with in men's re rejection of him. So down here in verse 18, after all of the abominations, it says this, Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe. Boy, you know, the Lord says it isn't a matter of one or two. I don't care if one whole tribe turns against me. This is what's going to happen. Whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Uh, that, that bitterness back there, how would a man get bitter against God after God took him out of 400 years of, uh, of bondage, after God loaded him up with the riches of Egypt, took him out of the land, put him in the Red Sea, and uh, showed him the, the miracle of uh, walking through those walls of water, destroyed the army after him, fed him miraculously with uh, food for 40 years, and then get bitter. Well, I don't know. Well, maybe because they were bitter because uh, Dan wasn't Levi and, and because uh, Levi's family wasn't of uh, Aaron's priesthood uh, class and because Moses, uh, uh, he wasn't perfect after all, you know. I, every, listen, to say how they do it is, well, well how do we do it? <laughs> it's just looking at other things without a regard for what God's done for us. If we could ever just be thankful, I think we'd, uh, we'd be pretty well occupied with, uh, with the Lord for a very long time about a lot of, a lot of things. But it uh, brings up bitterness. The Bible talks about that over in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Lest there be any root of bitterness and many be defiled. Uh, people have the idea, well, I'm just doing this myself. This, this is for me. And yet... Uh, the Bible is pretty clear that no man liveth or dieth unto himself. When, you, when we do things, we affect people around us. We might pretend like we don't. We might imagine that we don't. Uh, but we certainly do. Our attitude on the simplest things uh, can have great uh, consequence on people. I, I, I never forget, we, my wife and I had bought a house down in Groton. It was a horrible place, a lousy neighborhood, a miserable house. And I had a big wood pile out in the back of stuff I'd gathered up. And my father-in-law happened to be over one day, claimed to have walked the sawdust trail with Billy Sunday. And uh, then he, uh, I guess it kind of slipped away. <laughs> His excuses it didn't take. But uh, anyway, he's looking out in the back there and he says, uh, what would you do if somebody come out there and started stealing some of that wood? And I just said real flippantly, I'd just shoot him. And he looked at me, I mean, just serious heart attack, and he said, some Christian you are. And they well, that's, uh, did he really mean that? I think he really meant it. I was just kidding. I wouldn't shoot somebody over a piece of wood. God would. 
Well, I, I probably wouldn't. But uh, it was a lesson for me right there. Be careful what you tell people. Uh, they're looking for excuses to not trust Christ and let's not be who gives it to them. They'll, they'll find some somewhere, but let's not us uh, feed that, uh, that, that failure. All right, so uh, all of these things, they, they can be things that turn people away. The abominations of other people can be attractive uh, on a weaker moment, I guess. And uh, when you start feeling like you're just not getting what you deserve or what you uh, think is right, uh, you start looking around and that's, boy, that's a, that's a root of trouble. That's what got David uh, in a lot of trouble, cost him four, four of his children, uh, thousands of people in Israel. And I bet nobody that worked for David ever looked at David the same after the whole business with Uriah and Bathsheba and, and uh, Joab. Down here in verse uh, 20, Oh, excuse me, verse 19. And it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse, this, this is interesting, that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart to add drunkenness to thirst. How in the world would a man that's been through all those things look at that knowing the curse of God Bless himself. Hey, by the way, anybody know what that tic-tac-toe, three in a row, Hail Mary, here we go, business is in Catholicism? I'm going to bless myself. I, listen, it isn't like the Lord didn't know what was coming. These people, when they do that, they think they can do some uh, little magical uh, movements and stuff like that. God says, that ain't buying you a thing, buddy. All that's doing is just heaping uh, misery onto your guilt. But anyway, this man does it, and he says in his heart, I'll have peace. Well, I know what the Bible says, but, uh, you know, my in my religion, I know what the Bible says, but my God, yeah, well, he's not going to have peace. He's going to add to his drunkenness, add to everything else bad that's go along. And then verse 20, the Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. Man, you hear about being on fire? There's this, there, where there's smoke, there's fire. This guy is just begging for God's judgment. And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. That's a pretty interesting expression. How is the Lord going to blot out his name under heaven? Well, the uh, uh, one that betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, his name was blotted out. Uh, I would say in the Old Testament, since they didn't have an absolute promise of eternal security, it could be that you live by your faith, and if you if you believed what was right, and you did what was right. Uh, you remember, I think Jim mentioned this the other night, uh, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth. It says they were both righteous before the Lord, blameless concerning the law. Paul gave a testimony. This is a man causing people to be stoned to death. He says, as touching the law, blameless. Well, man, when you can be blameless touching the law and killing people, uh, that, that's a strange kind of thing. But that was their righteousness. Uh, back in Deuteronomy, let me, let me look here real quick. I think it's chapter 6 and verse uh, yeah, 25. Let me read verse uh, chapter 6, verse 24 and 25. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is uh, at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Isn't that interesting? A Jew's righteousness was doing what the law said. Did he sin? Yeah, and he, if he did, he brought the proper sacrifice and God uh, put that on his account. He says, I, I saw that. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll take that until uh, uh, the fullness of time comes in. Paul says they were ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, if you accept what God said about your sin and about a sacrifice being required for it, and you go and do it that way, 
you're not working for your righteousness per se. You're saying the righteousness of God is right. I violated it. I need to, in order to make that right, I've got to go to God. Uh, you remember the, uh, the thing in Ezekiel about if a man do right all his life and turn at the last days, all of his righteousnesses will be forgotten. So the Jew, it looks like, could, uh, could live, live a pretty righteous life, sin, turn away, and have nothing to, sh nothing to show for that life. On the contrary, a man could uh, live a wicked life, do right, die in, uh, in a righteous state. Man, that just don't seem fair. Well, doing what God told you would be fair. If the reward is obedience, that's what God's looking for. At any rate, uh, one thing you can be sure of, in the Old Testament, there was no assurance of eternal life for anybody. It's, it's very uh, infrequently mentioned. Anybody know how many times the word faith is mentioned in, from Genesis to the end of Malachi? Two times. That, listen, you, you think it must be everywhere. Now there's faithfulness and, and faithful are, are in there. And God certainly knew what faith was, but it's not in there like it is. Uh, man, you could find more than that in almost any, in any of the books of the New Testament at any place. So they, they had to live that. You remember when, uh, when uh, Peter preached his first message there over in Acts chapter 3? In Acts chapter 3, the men of Israel said, what must we do to be saved? That they understood salvation involved doing something in order to be right with God. But by that point, it's down to believing what God said about it. The schoolmaster had served its purpose. Jesus Christ's blood had made, uh, made the way. There are no more animal sacrifices effective. No sense in even uh, looking to that end. Okay, so let's, uh, we'll move along here from... Uh, from that particular place. Uh, by the way, the Gentiles here are not uh, exempt from those things. Over in Romans, it says the Gentile, chapter 2, the Gentiles who do by nature the things contained in the law are a law unto themselves. So they, uh, they had a, uh, a way of being uh, affected by God simply by knowing what was wrong and staying away from it and doing uh, what, what they knew to be right. Uh, this idea of blessing themselves and spitting in God's face with uh, assuring themselves of peace is uh, kind of like the, uh, the religion of the, uh, the uh, man that Dan had that he brought in there who was a Levite. And he said, boy, I'm going to have a great position here serving a whole tribe and not just uh, a little bit of service. God says, no, nah, you're not doing anything right. Going to be a bad way to go. Verse 21, And the Lord uh, shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law. Boy, that guy, how, how he could draw any comfort from thinking, well, I bless myself. It's, it's like the wicked woman over in Proverbs. Well, I've made my vows and I've given my offerings Let's take our loves now. <laughs> oh, I've sort of, I've covered the bases, you know. I, I went to confession uh, Saturday afternoon so I can go live like the devil for a while and figure I'm going to die in grace. Crazy people. Verse 22, So that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it, boy, the plagues and pestilences of the, uh, the judgment are uh, pretty serious, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Even all the nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? Jesus said that, uh, looking over the city, he says, Not one stone on that temple will be left standing. 
And those men, they'd taken him up there just to show him that, look at this, look at how great these stones are. Look at this mag magnificent building and look at all that it's put together and all that. And he just says, won't be a thing left of it. And within 40 years, it was all gone. All that was left was rubble. And you think, man, how in the world does man's great achievements come to nothing like that? Turn your back on God. You find out how quick you can go from the head of the nations to the, uh, to the shoe scrapings of, uh, of the whole world. Even the nations. Remember the Bible says that uh, Israel would become a byword and a, uh, a proverb to people. And that's just what they were, wandering Jews. That's, that's just what we're reading in these chapters here. God says, you don't do what's right, I'll throw you out and you'll be wandering around. You'll find no comfort, no rest, nowhere. They just had a, a, a vote in uh, Congress uh, t uh, today or yesterday. I don't know if anybody heard about it. It was uh, one of the Republican uh, congressmen uh, wrote a bill to uh, uh, censure uh, Hamas for their recent attack of Israel. Not one Democrat voted for that bill. What kind of person do you have to be to do that? Well, you have to be a godless, baby-killing, amoral deviant to do that. Every Republican voted for it. Now, that's not to say there probably are not a fair, <laughs> fair portion of them in, the, in, the, in that side of the, uh, the House. But not one Democrat voted for it. You know what that tells me? These people couldn't care less about anything that's right, moral, decent. Israel is our ally. Israel was attacked by these people. These people have, have uh, lobbed uh, 4,000 missiles into schools and hospitals and everything else. And Israel has done everything they can possibly do, delaying strikes, warning these people of what's going to happen. And they, and they still take that, well, Israel's bad. Joe Biden's in the process of uh, restoring the, the uh, horrible Omami deal with Iran. While Iran supplies weapons and explosives and stuff, uh, of stuff that our money is paid for, to Hamas, which our money pays for, to fight our enemies, who are the only people on, this, on the planet that think even remotely similar to the way we do. You think, what makes people that perverse? The devil. All nations hate Israel. O over the years, uh, you get to the Security Council, you get to all these kind of things. Israel's almost never on those things. They put, they put Palestinian terrorists on it, on a, on a peace mission. That, that's laughable. But not Israel. Israel is, uh, has become exactly what God said it would be. Look at verse 25. What meaneth the heat of this great anger? Verse 25. The men shall say, they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord of their, uh, God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. And the world knows what they did. You'd think that would make a difference to the world that the... Uh, the, uh, the New Testament and Jesus Christ's blood. But they reject that. And then look at Israel and say, well, look at what they did. Well, two wrongs don't make a right. And uh, the fact that somebody else is wrong, you ought to take a lesson from that. Verse 26, for they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. You know, ultimately, all the curses that are written in this book are what the tribulation is all about. Hell is even opened up, and all of the, the uh, vile and wicked things that are in there are released on the earth during the tribulation. Well, you know, people think, well, I get by without God. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, you might be able to, but I don't know why anybody would want to. That, that's really a sad kind of thing. Verse 28, And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger, 
and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. Well, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. And it's not, uh, it's not changing anytime soon. Most people think the Lord rooted them out. And the uh, Protestant churches think God's done with Israel forever. Stephen Anderson and uh, most of the uh, offshoot uh, reform characters and quacks like him think God's done with Israel forever. The Catholic Church thinks God's done with Israel forever. I think the devil probably thinks that God's done with Israel forever. And uh, God says, no, i got a remnant there. It's not big, but it's a remnant. It's enough, to, it's enough to take over the world with. It's enough to run things to suit me with. Uh, just got to get all the circumstances just right. And uh, anybody see those gears turning? Anybody see all those things, just all the little pieces beginning to fit? I think if the Antichrist was walk on the scene today, uh, the world would fall over themselves looking to worship him. Just... Yeah, yeah. Just just wait till the just wait till the the church is gone when when the last little bit of truth that can be found is uh, is silenced. Crazy. The last verse: the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to uh, unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The Bible says, what, what advantage then hath a Jew? Much in every way. For unto the Jew were committed the oracles of God. And you think about the Jews, God handed them his word. These are my words. This is everything that will make you great. This is everything that will give you into your hands and your family, everything you ever wanted. And they said, oh, thanks. Wow, this is great. Oh, but, but look at what they got. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? Well, yeah. I mean, it's great being saved and knowing your sins are forgiven and great heaven of God that says he'll never leave you, forsake you. Nice having a perfect Bible and nice having friends in church. And boy, it's nice knowing I'm going to go to heaven one day and nice knowing I got a mansion up there. But boy, you know, they, they get to go to parties. <laughs> If we had ever just dwelled a little bit on what God's done for us, we'd have no reason to ever worry about what anybody else is doing. No reason to look at them. You know, these, uh, these secret things, God revealed some of those secret things to Paul, gave one of them to John, revealed a bunch of the parables of the kingdom in Matthew. When we look at those things, and I'm not sure we, uh, we always have the right look at those. To know the future of the world, you think would be one of the greatest advantages men could have. And we're always trying to look for something a little bit different, a little bit deeper, a little bit further out or something. Well, just be thankful. We know what God's plan is. And I'm glad I'm in it. I'm glad he's uh, chosen me and allowed me to choose him. What a great, uh, great kind of thing. All right. Anybody got anything else? All right. We're done. <laughs> we'll, we'll end on that note. And uh, chapter 30 next, uh, we're going next week. All right.